on a bonus edition of the Locked On Suns podcast. The Suns are interested in TJ McConnell, Matt Ishbia. We're learning more about the balance between him and James Jones. And would Bull Bull really fit on this team? Let's go. You are Locked On Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we're back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past six seasons, a writer over at suns.com and the host of the Just Basketball Show, wherever you get your podcast. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen. Two episodes coming at you Thursday evening into Friday morning. Become an everyday or get locked onto the Phoenix Suns every single day throughout the offseason and beyond by hitting follow or subscribe wherever you're finding this show. We're free and available everywhere, including YouTube. All you got to do is search Locked On Suns. And again, hit that follow or subscribe button. We'll be right there with you. You can also comment below in the YouTube section, comment section. Do you want TJ McConnell or Bull Bull more? We're going to talk about both today, but let's start with McConnell. Um... So this kind of came out of nowhere, and it is from Jake Fisher over at Yahoo Sports. And I know I have seen, you know, uh, the Suns subreddit and any number of other places where Suns fans are a little bit skeptical of Fisher's connection to the Suns. What I will say is I don't know uh, anything about how he's getting his information, just like I don't know how anybody's getting their information at all, but... Uh, I trust Jake Fisher. I think he actually does better journalistic work than just about anybody covering this league when you think in more specific terms about what he is trying to do, which is always, always to tell you what has been out there or what might be coming, even if he's not trying to predict that every single thing he brings up is happening. And so that's kind of the the lens that you kind of have to look at this through, all right? And so what I think that means in this particular case is, honestly, that it's more important to think that the Suns, think about how the Suns could be shopping campaign, period, than it is to spend too much time on TJ McConnell in particular. What I will say about McConnell in particular, (laughs) with that said, because we've talked about campaign being available already, right? Last week, or on Monday's show with Brandon Duenas, we went through some of the opportunities and possibilities with these new three new second-round picks that the Suns acquired last week. Payne is obviously one of the obvious, probably the most likely candidate to have those second-round picks be combined with him in order to get some additional upgrade. DeAndre Ayton... Maybe uh, at some point, but that does not seem to be anywhere close to happening. And and I would imagine the Suns roll into the season with Aiton. They also have the trade exception, right? But Payne has always been kind of the most likely option. They have multiple ball handlers now. Jordan Goodwin is younger and potentially has a higher ceiling than Cameron Payne. All of these different factors make it not not much of a surprise that Payne's name was in this report. That's the most important aspect of it, that the trade talks are happening with him, but let's talk about McConnell because he's somebody that we have heard even before Jake Fisher. So even if you question him or anything like that, this is a guy who had had the sons have been connected with for years. He also is obviously a former Arizona wildcat and that might not typically matter, especially with Robert Sarver gone and he, his connections to the university of Arizona no longer matter here. Well, the Suns coaching staff has numerous ties to the University of Arizona now between um, Quinton Crawford, who just coached their, who is coaching their summer league team, as well as Miles Simon, who coached, uh, went to U of A, I'm sure still has connections and, and was the G League head coach in LA, as well as an assistant on the Lakers staff and everything in recent seasons. So the connections are there, they make sense, but the Suns also do need a point guard, to me, McConnell is kind of a better, more more stable version of what you're already getting with Jordan Goodwin, honestly. And so it kind of makes sense that the Suns, if if that's sort of the model of the type of player that the Sun, uh, that that the Vogel and the coaching staff want as a as a backup point guard or as just a a point guard option, that they would target McConnell. 
And not even just with, with Goodwin, but you think back to what those Lakers teams did. They had Dennis Schroeder, great point of attack defender, even if he is undersized and not able to guard up a position or any of that. The one thing he does at a very high level on defense is fight through screens and defend primary small ball handlers on the other team. Alex Caruso, prior to that, right, did the same thing for the Lakers where he was able to defend guards at a high level and allow Anthony Davis to be in that drop defense and, and contain the paint and the help to kind of come as long as he was connected to his man who, had, who was handling the ball. McConnell, Goodwin, those are both players who likely can do that, and so it makes some sense. I mean, T.J. McConnell as a guard is, you know, probably right behind Caruso. Maybe there's some others you would point to, but one of the very best point guard, point of attack, defensive specialists in the entire NBA. That's not an exaggeration, all right? And beyond that, I think what he does is, is fairly limited. He was a negative in terms of estimated plus minus over at dunksandthrees.com, which is kind of the the one that I use and the one that te- seems to be the most well-respected of those all-encompassing stats. He was a minus on offense, and he, his game is fairly limited. I mean, he is a guy who has had the ball in his hands his whole life, so I, I would say, you know, comfortable dribbling, comfortable running a basic pick and roll, initiating entry passes, you know, uh, taking the ball up the floor, some of the basic stuff that a, a six-foot-two point guard ought to be able to do, but as far as what he's really going to, to do himself as an offensive player, the most consistent thing is is really to just come off, come downhill off of that screen and get to the mid-range jumper. And that's, I mean, look, his mid-range frequency as a player has been in the 80th percentile or higher every single year of his career. And the most recent seasons uh that has leveled out a bit and he started to take more threes and more rim attempts so that's good especially last year 42 percent of his shot attempts came at the rim that's in the 98th percentile for a point guard so maybe there's a little more there as he ages and gets more comfortable and kind of physically knows what he's doing in the nba but for the most part that's what he does is he a fit in phoenix with all of that said i think yes it does make me wonder a little bit what the fate of Jordan Goodwin would be, but if maybe they still see him as a roster piece, just not somebody who maybe is going to start and play big minutes, or uh, probably won't start, but even somebody who might play big minutes right away, I think that's totally fine, and I think McConnell is a, is a great stopgap. The last thing I'll say, back to sort of the cap spe- specifics of all of this and, and everything else, um, as I'm looking here, McConnell makes... $8.7 million this upcoming season. And so uh, Cameron Payne's salary does not match one-to-one. And the Suns can only take back players who match one-to-one now. For, for anybody who may uh, have forgotten about all of that, you know, part of the second apron is that you can't take more salary than you're sending out anymore. And so if you look at that, Cameron Payne makes $6.5 million. Again, McConnell makes 8.7. So you're you're talking about sending out a minimum player. And that's I don't I don't know what to make of that. The Suns cannot trade any of the players they just signed. So it effectively would have to be Goodwin or Ish Wainwright. As far as I understand, there may be ways to do this with the trade exception. I'm always fuzzy on using a combination of a trade exception and a player or things like that. I I don't exactly know if those are even options. I guess that could be but otherwise, you're talking about Wainwright or Goodwin or I don't think Kamara can be traded either now that he has been signed officially to his contract. If they're able to get a deal like this done, though, the other good part of it, aside from the basketball fit, is his contract goes two seasons. And by his, I mean McConnell. 8.7 this year, 9.3 next year. It is only guaranteed for five next year. But I would imagine if you're trading for him, you like the idea of keeping him. And he is a veteran in the prime of his career where he makes a little more sense to bring onto a great team for multiple years than maybe even Goodwin does, even if Goodwin is somebody who still is going to be here. That's kind of where this all lands for me. I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if he would be a big difference maker, but I think it's smart. I think it aligns with what we already knew they were doing and uh, stylistically and with the cap. And 
I think it would make them, at least in theory, a little bit better. Let's talk about Matt Ishbia. Let's talk about James Jones. I think I made Aaron Edwards want to uh, quit the show when I made him talk about all of this for the umpteenth time uh, this past week. Uh, but I think it's interesting, and it tells us a lot. There's two main takeaways that I have. One is the uh, the extreme influence and role that Ishbia is playing, whether that is good or bad, and the adjustment that James Jones is making and why I don't think it's purely a bad thing. First, today's show brought to you by... Bird dogs. I have two pairs of bird dogs. I love them both dearly. I wore one of them today to go to the gym and uh, leg day. Perfect, actually, for leg day. Perfect for the Arizona sun. Both, even though I did get out there before it was too early in the morning on my walk to the apartment complex gym. But the reason it's perfect in both of those capacities is the fit is perfect, especially if you're trying to stretch and move. It is. I like the shorter inseam. Maybe you like longer. Either way, the leg is comfortable. The leg is flexible. It is the same thing as Lululemon, but they fit way better. They're not stiff. They're not restricting. They're not cotton, of course. So that cloud knit fabric that they have is perfect for movement, perfect for casual days and laying around and lounging around and getting, you know, the dog walk and all that stuff that you need to do every day, but still looks good while you're doing it. The most important thing maybe for an Arizona though is the anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. Again, I have an athletic pair. I have a lounge pair. I love them both. Go to birddogs.com slash LockedOnNBA. Enter the promo code LockedOnNBA to get a free Yeti-style tumbler, a little cup for you in addition to your purchase. That's birddogs.com slash LockedOnNBA or the promo code LockedOnNBA at checkout to get a free Yeti-style tumbler with your purchase. Moving right along, Brian Windhorst of ESPN wrote an article about the Suns winning at everything that they do, uh, in the terms, of, in the words of Matt Ishbia, who knows how to sell, right? And that's kind of where I want to go with this because he is, uh, he's a mortgage broker, right? And not only is he a mortgage broker, he is a mortgage broker who came from a family of mortgage brokers. And, you know, I think the, the background of him and his brother is, is interesting here too. And again, it's always awkward to talk about people like, you know, them, but I guess we do it with athletes. What's the difference? His brother is involved, but not as much, and uh, has kind of done his own things. I, th I believe might live in Chicago, if not has a, a great deal of business in Chicago, and that's Justin, right, who is also a part governor of this team, but uh, not the primary, not the, the managing partner, so to speak. Matt, though, he had the gall, right, to, to not only uh, take over this company and do everything that he did to grow it, but have the, I guess belief and sort of vision to say like i mean i i don't i'm sure they're close i'm sure you hand your business down to your son there's a certain level of open honesty that has to kind of come with that but like hey dad i'm going to do this better is not exactly the easiest thing to say or or the most um believable thing to make a claim to when you are a young man and, and he did that right he took it over and he very well did do it better at least in terms of making money and growing the business and everything else and so I think that's important context when you talk about, again, what he's good at, which is bigger, better vision and, and people skills and selling stuff. I mean, a mortgage is not, we don't call that sales, but effectively you are making deals with banks. You are making deals with different, um, you know, real estate companies and obviously all the way down to the people level. There is a, a chain of, of money movement and, and happy customers that needs to continue to be there in order for your business to succeed. Uh, and they have gone from one of, the, one of the companies locally in the Midwest to maybe the biggest in the country under the tutelage and watch of, of Matt Ishbia. And I think he's operating in a similar way here. And so some of the details from this story are, uh, you know, things we've, we know about factually, right? Like he is in this legal battle over airing games on what I believe is going to be kind of channel 45 again, locally instead of Bally sports, the trade for Durant, the trade for Beal, uh, the, the kind of additional years on these minimum contracts that allowed him to beat out offers from other teams. But some of the stuff that we did not know is that he led the pitch meeting on Bradley Beal. He called and actually, uh, sorry, on, on Beal, but also on Eric Gordon, who spoke to that uh, at the Summer League interview that he did during the Suns' last game on Tuesday. And apparently also personally called the 
minimum players that they signed between Yuta Watanabe and Keita Bates, Diop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to talk about the Isaiah Thomas stuff anymore because I understand there's only so much we know and I'm not going to bore you or make it dramatic and, and deep every single time we discuss this stuff, but that is referenced here in the article as well. And I'll get to James Jones in a second, but that's what I think Ishbia wants, wants this to look like, right? I don't know what his relationship with Josh Bartlestein was. He hasn't necessarily, we don't have the details of how they met or any sort of details about when was it from the beginning of Matt Ishbia bidding for these different teams that he told Bartlestein he was going to come along with him? Did it only change when it became basketball because Josh Bartlestein is from a basketball family as far as his dad being a power agent and him working for the Pistons? I don't know. But it's very clear that Josh is a major part of this. James Jones has said openly that his role has actually grown since Ishbia took over, or at least his sort of voice and, and say. And there's a detail in this Windhorse article that Jones had a, uh, a dr was a driving force, quote-unquote, in the decision to move on from Monty Williams, right? And you're talking about, at the same time, Still, some of these key players as far as, you know, assistant general managers and obviously some of these informal advisors from his basketball past, including Thomas, but also Charlie Bell, Mateen Cleaves, Tom Izzo, people who he has formal relationships with uh, in business and in life that are, we can assume, you know, <laughs> they are discussing these things and, and Ishbia is, is choosing whether to believe them or not. That leads us to James Jones, or not believe, but... Ishbia is choosing whether to incorporate their input into what he actually ends up doing. Which brings us to Jones, right? And so I think James Jones's superpower as a general manager, and I've said this before, is it, it, even dating back to why he was so effective, not only executing and getting deals done, but getting more uh, leeway to operate than Ryan McDonough dating back to the Robert Sarver time. The superpower is connecting his vision, and by his I mean Jones, to ownership's goals and selling what he wants to do to the owner in a way that the owner can vibe with it, <laughs> to use, uh, you know, very Gen Z kind of terms there, right? Like that's, that's what I think that it is. And when he took over in 2018, the goal was get better. So... We saw Robert Sarver do things that he had never done in the past, right? Um, spend money to cut players, right? Like buyouts. And the Suns had Kyle Korver on their team for 12 hours. If you remember in the De'Anthony Melton, Josh Jackson trade, uh, all of that, that all happened. Um, you ended up with Kyle Korver here and, and they they cut him, right? They, they waved him and bought him out. Some of those types of things. Next summer, they offer my, uh, Monty Williams enough money to have him pick the Suns over the Lakers, and they invest in a real coaching staff. I've gone through all this before, but you fast forward to now, and I think that what Jones' role is now is much more leeway, even than he had under the Sarver, who, which is even more than McDonough had under Sarver, right? So it's just kept growing, but... There is this very CEO, modern, you know, business tycoon type of way about what Ishbia does and, and the way that you can see it in where, in, in where, in how he speaks. Like I mentioned a minute ago, the bigger and better, and we're going to win at everything and all that, it, it, it's empowerment. And that word is like a very big buzzword in these types of places, right? Because it's like, I'm not going to sort of, I, I'm not fully going to tell you how to execute. I'm not even going to tell you what you need to execute, but I'm going to encourage you to think bigger than what you're thinking now. And most importantly for a guy like James Jones, I'm going to give you the assets and tools to make it happen, right? And so that's where I think Jones comes in. Ishbi has made it clear, calling Yuta Watanabe, who is, you know, only recently even solidified himself as an NBA player and may not even be in the playoff rotation of this team to seal the deal on a, con a free agency contract for a minimum is an unorthodox thing for an owner to do, but that that shows Jones, okay, right? I'm Ishbi is the people person. Ishbi is the, the salesman here. He is the visionary. He is, is all of these things. I have my own vision. I get to sell that to him, but I also have all these resources and tools along the way and, and alongside me to go out and, and execute what that vision is, and that's 
what is be uh, what Jones's job is execute come up with stuff make it happen think big uh, deploy your staff in such a way that it can happen right I mean we've seen some creative cap and draft maneuvers that we just didn't see in the past is that because somebody that got hired is suddenly smarter than the rest of the team used to be no I, I doubt that Trevor Buckstein is the assistant GM who's been here forever still works with the Suns and I'd imagine he had some of those things up his sleeve right so it is now to a point where Jones is being empowered and encouraged to go out and do those things make those tricks happen spend resources whether that's money or anything else and and do it and so I I think Windhorse is very careful to to acknowledge that the the Isaiah Thomas factor and some of these other things are not exactly fully fleshed out but that's true of any owner it's just not true that all owners are so loud about it and it's not so it's not true that all owners private confidants or former NBA legends, right? Or even uh, non-legends like Charlie Bell or Mateen Cleaves, people who we know who know basketball and that it just clouds it all, makes it a little trickier to get your arms around. But nevertheless, it uh, it's, it's happening. I'm sure Steve Ballmer has people he talks to about the Clippers. We just probably don't know their names and we don't care about their names, right? So that's where I think this all is. I totally buy that James Jones has more of a voice and more, uh, you know, of a green light here than he ever has, even though people thought he might get fired, right? I I think Josh Bartlesine is somebody we need to continue to pay attention to, and I would imagine that the front office and some of these other uh, facets of the business will continue to be filled out and invested in. Let's talk about Bol Bol and Saban Lee, who I was not expecting to talk about as I did not introduce it at the top of the show, but he is back on the Suns on a two-way contract despite not playing in Summer League. That email came through as... I was recording, so we'll break down those two guys next, as well as what this whole back of the roster stuff will mean come the start of the season. First, today's show brought to you as well by the FanDuel Sportsbook, America's number one sportsbook, and the official sports betting partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. If that's not enough, I know a lot of you are tuning into baseball, because if you're a local fan, you are probably having a blast with this Diamondback season just like me, and you can take your first swing at betting MLB on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount and bonus bets up to $200. That's right, just bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's $200 that you can spend betting on everything from the money line to the over under to who you think is going to get the first home run in a game, all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you get paid instantly. Just tuck, tuck, deposit that money right back into your account with no problem. There's no better place to bet on in, on the MLB than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel is an official sports betting partner, the official partner of Major League Baseball. Let's close out the show talking about two guys who will likely to be at the end of this roster for Phoenix, right? So keep in mind, again, as we were talking about with the campaign uh, <laughs> campaign reports, let's let's call them that. Um, if they're l- looking for somebody who makes more than pain, you're probably talking about a trade that includes Goodwin or Wainwright. Again, it kind of confuses me just as much as it probably confuses you, but that's fine. Let's just keep that tucked in the back of our brains as we're talking through these possibilities. So, Bull Bull, three things that could happen here, right? One, he gets signed to a sort of a training camp contract. This is a guy who is still out there on the free agent market, right? And that's part of, I'm sure, why the Suns are even considering it because it's like maybe they didn't think that he was going to be available or they hadn't really thought about him too deeply. And now where, you know, 12 days into free agency, it doesn't seem like he has many other great offers if he's still out there. So they could just bring, bring him in on a training, contra- training camp contract if nobody else is interested, if that's maybe one of his better offers, right? Or they could bring him in on a two-way contract, as Saban Lee just got, which we will discuss momentarily. Or they could bring Bull Bull in and cut somebody else in order to give Bull Bull a guaranteed roster spot. There's also the factor of, like, do you give him a fully guaranteed contract, even if he is getting a regular NBA roster spot there? I guess there's more than three options, but we don't want to get too complicated. If you're cutting somebody, the idea is that you're going to keep Bull, right? 
the Suns are not going to be able to get buyout players. So this is kind of their one opportunity to nail the roster outside of a pain or eight and trade down the line. That's the that's the machinations. The thing I really want to talk about, because I've referenced some of that stuff before, is does he fit here? And the reason that I do from a personal standpoint is personal for him and for the coaching staff who would want to develop him. He's not exactly young before and I, uh, young anymore, and I've said that before, right? He's the same age as Tumani Kamara, even though we think of him as this sort of raw prospect. He's been in the league for four years now, and he only played nine games in college. This past year was the only year he really ever played consistent basketball. He played 70 games for Orlando. His impact was greater at the beginning of the season, less by the end. And he left on questionable terms. I know that there's been rumors all the way to Oregon, including Denver and now Orlando. Of like, why is this guy not seem to vibe in his environment? I don't know the answer to that. Again, the reason I think he will fit here, though, maybe if I'm making the case for why, I don't not I don't know the details of any of the personal stuff well enough, but I think there is a happy medium that the Suns could present to him, which would be this. You're going to be in an environment similar similar to what you were in in Denver, where you are on a good team. You don't get you're not guaranteed or promised or gifted minutes. But what will be a little bit more similar to your Orlando experience, Bull Bull, is that you will actually be invested in. You will get chances to develop and compete and and get better in a real way. Whereas it feels like the coaching staff in Denver, maybe there was an, an excitement early on, but by the end, he was on the outs. I did not feel like there was a lot of promise or hope for what he could become. They left, they let him go, no, no problem. Orlando played him, but he wasn't that great. I think that the Suns could be a little bit in the middle. And, and so that's sort of the personal standpoint. Basketball-wise, it's hard to say what Bull Bull is, but in the same way that I've been... Uh, excited if you've been listening to my summer league thoughts on this week's shows if you're an everydayer is that I've been ex- kind of excited or intrigued by Trey Jemison it'd be the same with Bull Bull right neither one of those guys are are, are a lock to, to be NBA caliber players right away but if it is a non-guaranteed deal if it is a two-way contract potentially which maybe feels like a step back for Bull Bull but I don't actually oh wait I don't think he's I wish I could rewind. I wish that I could go back. Uh, I, do, I do not tend to edit these podcasts. So I'm realizing in real time that I do not think he's eligible for a two-way contract anymore. So that's not an option. If it's a non-guaranteed deal, then I guess is what I would say. Or if it is a guaranteed contract in place of somebody like Wainwright, who did not figure to make a big impact on this team, from a basketball standpoint, I think it makes sense to try it. And I like that it would provide them with size to finally arrive at the basketball part of this in a real way on the court, right? I like balancing this roster, even if it is just with somebody who is an insignificant part of the team in theory, just to have the option, you know, especially if it's somebody younger who can continue to get better, which Jemison and Bull both would be. I think Bull is, the upside is obviously better and the proven commodity part is even better too. At least he's had minutes in the NBA and not fallen apart or gotten, you know, sent to some overseas league already, right? That's better than Jemison can say, who just came out of college. So I like the idea. It doesn't it's not always that it has to be somebody who's seven three and, and all the physical characteristics that Bull Bull has, but it is at least a big center. It is at least somebody bigger than six nine, which is what Jemezi Metu and Drew Eubanks both are. Somebody who could protect the rim in a more conservative scheme like Frank Vogel likes to play, who would play the five here, which I think is important. I don't he played the four a lot in Orlando. And he didn't play much of anything in Denver. And I believe they usually played other bigs with him there too. So I like drop him into the paint, have him protect the rim. And then, you know, maybe he's a pick and pop player or maybe he's just sort of a dunker spot corner guy on offense and you try to have him turn over the ball less and work on his hands and positioning and, and rep up what he is as a pick and roll player. Get get the ball out of his hands. That's not That's not where he needs to be, right? And those are some of the things I think you could see him blossom with if he did come here. I don't know if it'll happen. The rumors have been out there for a while, including from Shams, in addition to John Gambadoro. It's weird with the fact that, you know, the Suns have guys they can cut and they have some options available to them. If they're interested, why not do it? I don't know. 
Maybe there is something related to this pain trade that they're exploring that, that might move them in one direction or the other. I am not too sure, but regardless, the idea in theory is pretty fun. That'll wrap us up. Bonus episode for you there. We might have another one. If Tamani Kamara looks like an absolute freak on Friday in Summer League, maybe you will get another episode out of me. We'll see. Until then, hit follow, hit subscribe, get the next show and many more in your feed every single day throughout the offseason and beyond. And I will catch you all next time.